Hi everyone, good morning, good afternoon. Um, thank you for joining us today. So my name is Cecile and I am a French and Chinese conservationist based here in Canada. I'm affiliated to the Canadian Wildlife Federation through the Canadian Conservation Corps program, which I will introduce to you in more detail at the end of this talk. So I'm really happy to be here with you today to talk about our vital connection to water and of course, how to become ocean superheroes. Before we start, I just want to mention that this webinar, um, during this webinar, we'll be having some polls. Uh, you can also use the Q&A section of Zoom to write any questions that, that you're going to have throughout the session. I'm joined here by Kaylee, the Experiential Education Manager uh, from CWF, and she also helped me keep an eye on the chat. So let me share my slides with you. Okay, I hope this is working. Perfect, everyone can see my slides? Yeah, great. Well, today's topic is what are we without oceans? And I'm sure you can already guess <laughs> we're not much without oceans. Uh, water is something that's very, that's vital for our survival and that we use also every single day. So we're going to dive right into this topic and see why that is the case. Okay, first, let's take a look at the planet that we call home, our beautiful planet Earth. In your opinion, is there more land or more water at the surface of the planet? And for this, I will just start a poll that ask you this question. Okay. I hope you can see the question. So again, the question is, is there more land or water at the surface of the planet? You have many uh, options to choose from. The first one is there is more land. The second one, there is more water. The third one is if you think that it's equal amounts of land and water, and the fourth uh, option is I don't know, which is also completely fine. So make sure you select the uh, answer that you think makes the most sense. Okay, great. I will end the poll now and I will share the results. Great, you can see most of you got it correct. It's, uh, there's indeed more water at the surface of our planet. So well done. And in fact, this is why we call planet Earth the blue planet or also the blue marble because water and ice covers about 75% of our planet's surface. And this means that the continents on which we live on are in fact big islands in the midst of vast flowing water currents. It also kind of means that we as inhabitants are all water creatures. So let's now zoom onto Canada, this country that we live in. As Canadians, we're very lucky to have immense water resources. And I wanted to share with you some interesting facts. First, did you know that we have the world's longest coastline? Yep, all 243,792 kilometers of it. Now let's say it takes on average 12 minutes to walk one kilometer. We would be walking for more than five and a half years just to completely walk that coastline, which is a long time, five and a half years. Canada also has three oceans, it borders three oceans. And if you click on the chat, um, can you guess the names of these oceans? Feel free to write them in the chat. So again, we're talking about um, oceans that surround Canada. Very good, I can Alan see- Alan says right. Atlantic and Tiffany says Pacific. Atlantic and Pacific and Arctic, Jill, I said Arctic as well. Perfect, yes. Thank you so much. 
That is indeed the case. We have the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, and the Arctic Ocean. So we have three oceans around Canada. We're all aware of the Great Lakes. Um, and some of you may know this already, but we have a lot of lakes. In fact, more than 2 million lakes, which is 62% uh, of the world's lakes. So that's more lake area than the rest of the world combined. And finally, of course, Canada also has a lot of rivers. In total, more than 8,500 rivers. So that just gives you a sense of the amazing water resources that we're lucky to have here in Canada. Now I want to invite you to look at this picture. And of course you can see that there is water in this picture in the river, in the ocean. And water can be put into categories. So first we have fresh water. Fresh water is water that has a tiny bit of salt, less than 1% of salt. And this includes ponds and swamps, puddles, and that water stays there. It's mainly, um, it doesn't move mainly. So that's why we call it standing fresh water. We also have fresh water in streams and rivers. And that water, as you already know, moves and flows around, hence the name flowing uh, fresh water. So if you look at the picture, that bit that circled, you can see that there's this river that flows. Now this is flowing uh, fresh water that we're talking about. On the opposite side, we also have salt water or water with a lot more salt. And this is the water that we find in our oceans. So we have fresh water that's flowing here in the river and that slowly flows towards the ocean. And right here, we have salt water. Now this area in the middle, which is where the salt water and the fresh water mixes, this is called an estuary an estuary. And these are just some terms associated to water that you may have heard before. What's interesting to know is that Canada has 20% of the planet's freshwater resources. Yeah, 20%, which is why we're considered a water rich country. So together today, we'll be exploring our water system a bit more. The planet needs oceans because all the elements on the planet are carefully balanced, including water, air, soil, and living things such as us, such as humans. And all of these elements form a community that we can call an ecosystem, which could be anything from a very small puddle to our entire planet. What's important to remember is that everything in an ecosystem is interconnected, just like the vital systems in your body. So let's uh, take a minute and think. Okay, so what do we have in our bodies? We each have a heart, we have our liver, we have kidneys, we have our lungs to breathe, we have our brain, we also have veins flowing all around our bodies. And imagine what would happen if any one of those elements would simply stop working. Our whole body would stop working, right? And possibly just collapse. So it's the same thing in an ecosystem. Everything is carefully balanced and most importantly, everything works together. So on planet Earth, since the beginning of time, we have the same amount of water that has splashed around the planet. And that water travels in a cycle that we call the water cycle or the hydrologic cycle. So this is what we're going to look at together um, next. I invite you to also free one of your hands because we're going to be moving that hand around. Okay, I'm, I will show you the hand movements. Okay, so let's start with the water cycle or again, the hydrologic cycle. The water cycle happens when the sun's heat changes water to vapor. So this is the hand movement that we're gonna do, perfect. So this hand movement shows water changing into vapor. And this process is called evaporation. And what you can see also here at the back of the slide is the process called transpiration. And this is also going to be the same hand movement. 
This is a process where plants and trees, they also give up vapor through their leaves. So plants and trees will take up water through their roots. That water will travel all the way up. And then through the leaves, we have transpiration. Again, both processes mean that water is changed into vapor. What happens when this vapor cools down is that it forms clouds. So this is going to be my cloud. And this process is called condensation. This is when the vapor gets into the air and condenses into a cloud. And these clouds are then transported by air currents. So perfect, yes, those clouds are moving, right? <laughs> So these clouds are transported by air currents around the globe. Now, when the clouds are too heavy with water, I'm sure you can already guess what happens. It falls back down, okay? So this is the hand movement we're gonna do, very good. So these, this water will fall back down towards the surface of the planet and it can fall back down as rain or as snow, also as hail. You, you, I'm sure you know the little ice pellets that can also fall back down um, from the sky. And this process is called precipitation, okay? Precipitation. Once that water falls back on the land or in rivers or lakes, it ultimately is all collected and it will go back to the ocean. Awesome, yeah, so we're going to do that, this wave movement. So this is simply called the collection phase where water is collected back into the ocean. So what happens once it goes back to the ocean? Well, this cycle starts again, okay? So let's go through this cycle once again, but this time a bit faster. So we have water in the ocean, we have salt water, and we have, the first thing is evaporation, okay? That vapor becomes, sorry, that water becomes vapor and it forms clouds. Now my cloud then goes all around the globe. It gets transported by wind currents. And at some point it gets too heavy and precipitation, right? So that's rain or snow. And then that water slowly gets collected back into the ocean. And this cycle continues again and again and again. So this is what we call the water cycle. This cycle is very important for our ecosystem to work correctly. And you and I, we are also part of it. And what's interesting is that no matter where you live, you're directly linked to the ocean, thanks to what we call your watershed and your drainage basin, which is what we will look into now. So a watershed. What you should know is that all land is divided into watersheds. And a watershed is simply an area where all the surface water drains into the same place. So if you and I, we live in the same watershed, this means that when it rains close to your home and when it rains close to my home, the water will ultimately make its way to the same place. For example, the same river. So let's look at this drawing. This is the drawing of our watershed. And here we have a little building. Uh, can you see my mouse? Yeah, perfect. So let's imagine this is where you live. And then I live in this little blue house here. So no matter how far we are from, from how far our houses are from each other, because when it rains on your house and when it rains on my house, the water will, ulti will ultimately make it to this river. So we can say that we're watershed buddies. We share uh, the same watershed. Now, a group of watersheds is called a drainage basin. And this is where all the water collected will eventually drain into the same ocean. So let's now imagine your house and my house, we live very far away from each other. We're in completely different watersheds. The water that rains here on your home it travels to river A. And the water that melts from snow on my home, well, it travels to river B. They're different rivers. So we don't share the same watershed. But river A and river B ultimately end up in the same ocean. Mm, let's say, for example, the Atlantic Ocean. 
If that's the case, we can then say that we share the same drainage basin. So we're not watershed buddies, but we are drainage basin buddies. And this is why wherever you live, the water drops that rain down on your house, well, they'll ultimately be part of an ocean. So let's take a look at the drainage basins in Canada. Canada has six drainage basins and they're named after their final destination. So if we start here, in light blue, we have the Pacific Ocean Drainage Basin. This means that the water will ultimately go into the Pacific Ocean. Then we have the Arctic Ocean Drainage Basin here in gray. In dark blue, the Hudson Bay Drainage Basin and out on the east, the Atlantic Ocean Drainage Basin. We also have right down here in dark gray, we have the Gulf of Mexico Drainage Basin and also some internal, internal drainage basin. So these are the drainage uh, basins in Canada. Now, I just wanna give you an example. So this is, uh, let's just think, let's just assume that this is where I live and up here is where my mother lives. Now it's very, very far, I'm very far from her. However, you can see that we are in the same drainage basin, right? The Arctic Ocean drainage basin. Again, another example, let's say this is where uh, Kaylee Lee lives and this is where Kaylee's parents live. Again, very far uh, from each other, but they share the same drainage basin, the uh, Pacific Ocean drainage basin. And what's interesting is that even though Kaylee and I, well, we're closer in distance, we actually don't share the same drainage basin. So now I want to start another poll to see which drainage basin you currently live in. Let's get that going. So you should be able to see the uh, options that are showing up on your screen. Again, the question is which drainage basin do you live in? And on your screen, you can also see that map. Um, so Canada has six drainage basins. And if you don't know, there is the option, I don't know, this is also completely fine. Oh, great. Okay, I'm going to keep it up for a while, a few um, more seconds. Let me know in case um, you don't see the question pop up on your screen, but you should see a poll asking you which drainage basin you currently live in. And you have the options, the Arctic Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, the Gulf of Mexico, Hudson Bay, Pacific Ocean, or also the internal drainage basin. Great, okay, I am going to end the poll now. And let me also share the results with you. So you can see, wow, okay, the Atlantic Ocean. So more than 50% of you are based in the Atlantic Ocean drainage basin, the Hudson Bay, the Arctic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean basin as well. Great. So we do have a, we do have uh, drainage basin buddies here, right? <laughs> Me personally, I am located in the Atlantic Ocean uh, drainage basin. And uh, Kaylee, which drainage basin are you located in? I'm in the Hudson Bay when I'm based in Calgary and I'm right on the continental divide of the Rocky Mountains. So on the opposite side of the mountains, it goes to the Pacific and on my side uh, where I'm at, it goes into Hudson's Bay, so kind of right on the edge of the drainage basins there. And just a quick thing, Cecile, I saw in the chat, someone was asking about the internal drainage basins and where they go. Um, and I guess, you know, suffice to say, they don't really go anywhere. The internal drainage basin just retains water and doesn't flow to the ocean. So hopefully that clarifies that question for some people. Exactly, yes, thank you. Let me know if there are any more questions. Uh, thank you, Kaylee. <laughs> Okay, so 
I am going to just stop sharing my screen for a while. Okay, hopefully you can all see me. Hello. Okay, so I wanted to take this uh, opportunity to do a little recap of what we've seen so far. Uh, we know that we live on the blue planet or also called the blue marble. And that of course, Canada has a lot of water resources. We have a lot of lakes, a lot of rivers, uh, a lot of the world's freshwater resources. And then we saw that water goes through this cycle that never ends that we call the water cycle, right? So it starts with evaporation, condensation into clouds, and then these clouds, well, they move around. Ultimately, it precipitates back down as rain or snow or hail, and then it gets collected back into the ocean. We also then looked at our personal connection to the ocean through our watershed and our drainage basin. So we also mentioned at the beginning that we um, really need water every single day, right? For example, we drink water every single day because we're thirsty. I'm sure if I asked everyone, okay, raise your hands if you drank water today, I'm sure most of your hands would be up. And in fact, our, our human bodies are more than 60% water. So it's easy to understand that we can't live without it. Now you may wonder, okay, I'm 60% water, but what does this water actually do in my body? Well, water, first of all, it carries nutrients to all the parts of your body. It helps you digest. Of course, it flushes out waste. Uh, it's really vital for the good functioning of our brain and our heart and the blood that's flowing in our veins. We just can't get enough of it. And now I'd like us to think of other things that water does for us or gifts us. And I was wondering if you can think of anything that water gives you. Feel free to write them in the chat if you have any ideas. Uh, for example, if you have a favorite product or food that comes from the water or from the ocean, or if you have some favorite water-based experiences. Um, Kaylee, do you have anything close by that can illustrate your connection to water and would you like to share them with us? I have to unmute. Yeah, sure. So I know you were asking me this question. So I did a quick run around my house to see what kind of oceans related things I could find. So I went in my cupboard. I have a container of sea salt that comes, it says from the Mediterranean Ocean. Uh, I had some like fish sauce, which is, I guess, made from anchovies, which are also found in the ocean. And then I had some seaweed snacks as well. So these are also ocean. So I have a fair number of groceries in my cupboard that are, are from the ocean. Awesome, thank you, that's great. Um, as for me, perhaps you notice, but I have these earrings on me that have manta rays. Um, I also have one of my favorite dresses on with uh, seahorses. I don't know if it's very clear, but it's pink seahorses. <laughs> so for me, water and more specifically marine environments, well, they provide me the opportunity to learn about marine species and different animals, such as seahorses and the manta rays. Um, so this is also a gift that I consider uh, I receive from water. I don't know if uh, there were yes, any responses. There is, yeah, some in the chat. So Donna said precipitation for uh, the garden. Absolutely. It's definitely gardening season. Um, the sound of water. Uh, water uh, with the help of sun gives rainbows. Yeah, water for the gardens, beach days, the sound of ocean water. Um, yeah, food, but also, you know, challenges of, you know, making good choices about which food, whether it's, um, farmed or wild things like that water activities as well you know things that you can do um, with water that's fun like games and play so lots of good ideas in the chat lots of connections that's great i'm i'm glad to hear so many uh ideas and i i really like the comment about also the choices of food and this is something that we will mention uh in a bit So I will share my screen with you again. Okay, there we go. 
Can you see my screen? Yeah, perfect. Okay, well, thanks again for sharing all these ideas regarding the gifts that we receive from the sea. And um, there's a lot that you mentioned. So we're going to look at them again all together. So one that was mentioned, of course, is um, the water that we drink and that we use for cleaning cars and watering. I think someone said watering a garden, watering flowers. We also use water to uh, bathe and to shower. And this is really the water that we use every single day. We also mentioned food. So fish and lobster, shrimp, also the seaweed that Kaylee showed us. So, so many delicious things that we love to eat and that come from our oceans or rivers or lakes. Uh, we can even say that we have a submarine supermarket because the ocean really gives us a lot of food. Next, the weather. The ocean definitely affects the wind, it affects rain, and it affects snow. And water currents actually also absorb heat in the summer and then releases it in the winter. So it helps control temperature and it helps regulate our climate. Now, I don't know if you can guess what this image shows. <laughs> it's oxygen. So that's a surprising one. Uh, but in reality, every second breath that we take, it comes from water. So without water, we wouldn't have oxygen or at least we wouldn't have 50% of the oxygen that we, uh, that we have now. I also want to mention transportation and travel because 80% of the cargo or stuff that is transported is actually on ships. And that stuff gets transported from one side of the globe to another. So when we buy things, there's a good chance that they travel on oceans first before getting to us. Of course, we can also use waterways to travel from one point to another. Another gift from the ocean and from um, our, water, uh, our water environments is the economy. And we're talking here about fisheries, about aquaculture, which is seafood farming. And of course, it provides a lot of jobs to fishermen. Next, I want to mention medicine because researchers, they, well, they have found antibiotics and anti-infection agents thanks to our marine species. So we, in addition to having uh, a floating supermarket, we also have a floating pharmacy thanks to uh, our rivers and our oceans. One that was mentioned before is wildlife because water environments, they provide vital habitats and migration routes to the wildlife that we love uh, to observe. So here, for example, we can see a bear that's likely fishing or just out for a swim. And there's a lot of animals and, of, and plants that depend on water environments to survive. I know at some point someone mentioned uh, water-based activities, right? So, Recreation is a big gift that we receive from water. We love to go swimming and surfing and, and sailing, canoeing, fishing. Um, a lot of our favorite family activities year round are also water-based. Now here is Finding Nemo. So stories like Aquaman, Finding Nemo, Moana and Titanic, all of these stories and movies and books and artwork, paintings, sculptures that are inspired by our oceans and their inhabitants. So inspiration, the inspiration that we receive from um, the seas and the oceans is also a gift. And finally, I want to mention heritage, such as the spiritual significance of a coastline to Aboriginal peoples or the cultural value of an estuary. So these are all the different types of gifts that we receive from the sea. And there are a lot of them, as, as you can see, uh, but we're definitely not the only ones to receive such valuable gifts. Now I want to talk to you about other water creatures or other animals and plants that also uh, receive such gifts. So remember that even though we don't live in the water, we are water creatures because we can't survive without it. And life, in fact, on planet Earth, well, it started in water. 
Uh, that's indeed the case for all forms of life on our planet. We have ocean habitats and especially those places that are close to the land that we call coastal zones. Well, they support a lot of plants and animals. And we need all these plants and animals to thrive in order to maintain our planet's biodiversity. Biodiversity, you may have heard that word before. So what it means is all the living things on the planet, including humans, animals, plants, but also species that are too small to be seen by the human eye. So in essence, it means the rich variety of life on earth. And water is really key uh, to allow biodiversity to thrive. So migratory species like waterfowl and shorebirds, marine mammals and fish, sea turtles, they rely on the ocean as a link between different habitats. And talking about all of these fascinating species would take a long time, days, if not weeks, but I do have time uh, to mention a few. So here you can see the leatherback sea turtle, which is the world's largest sea turtle. It can grow to more than two meters in length and weigh more than 900 kilograms or around 2000 pounds. They are very powerful swimmers and they swim very large distances every year. For example, they arrive in the Atlantic Canadian waters to forage every summer. We also have the North Atlantic right whale. So this unfortunately is one of the most endangered large whale species on the planet. There's only about 400 individuals remaining today. And unfortunately, whaling, which is what we call the practice of hunting whales, really had a devastating impact on its population. They're now protected though, uh, but there are still some threats that persist. So for example, they can get stuck in fishing gear or they can also collide with ships. So in Canada, we can find them along the Eastern coast uh, where they come to feed. Canada also has five groups of beluga whales found in its waters, and some of which are endangered as well. These are very vocal animals. They're known to use a wide range of whistles and grunts and squeals to communicate be between them because they're very sociable animals that live and hunt and migrate together in a group. What's interesting about beluga whales is that they are actually Arctic species, so they're used to sea ice. In the St. Lawrence estuary, there is a population of around 900 individuals though. And this is the most southern group of beluga whales in the world. They are isolated from other populations. I'm sure you can already guess that because beluga whales are Arctic species, uh, our changing climate and the melting of sea ice is a threat to their survival. I also want to mention a bird uh, because we have a lot of birds that depend on uh, the ocean and rivers and lakes. And here we have a whooping crane, which is North America's tallest bird. And during the summer breeding season, they inhabit areas with wetlands or shallow ponds, and they actually build their large nests in shallow waters as well. The only self-sustained wild population, so a self-sustained wild population is a population of the animal that is stable without the help of humans. It breeds in the Northwest Territories and Alberta's Wood Buffalo National Park. And before the winter comes, these birds would fly to the USA every year. So how many whooping cranes do we have currently? There's about 500 wild whooping cranes left, uh, but 80 years ago, there were only 20 of them. So that's already a big, uh, progress, a big jump, 20 to 500. These are also endangered due to uh, human activity. Now, I also want to mention plankton because a huge and vital part of the ocean ecosystem is plankton. These are tiny, tiny plants called phytoplankton and tiny, tiny animals called zooplankton. And they feed an amazing variety of ocean creatures. For example, the North Atlantic right whale, well, it eats a lot of zooplankton. And what we see is that phytoplankton is eaten by zooplankton, and then zooplankton is eaten by small fish. These small fish are in turn eaten by medium-sized fish. 
and then these medium-sized fish are eaten by larger fish. So you can see they're really the base, the basic, basic, basic food of everything. And it's also phytoplankton that provides almost half of the oxygen that we breathe. So you can see there's, uh, we, were, we just had the time to highlight some of the uh, wonderful animals that uh, need water to survive. There's a lot of them. And in general, there's still a lot that we don't know about the oceans and ocean life. So I will now ask you a question. Uh, oh, so I can't. Hmm. Sorry, Katie, could you help me and do the launch the next poll, please? Yep, I've got it right here. So I'll yep. launch it now. Sorry about that. Thank you. Aha, perfect. Yes. So the question is in your opinion, how much of the ocean is still unexplored? You have different options, 5%, 20%, 50%, or 80%. Now, I already gave you a hint because I already told you, well, there's quite a lot that we don't know about oceans and ocean life. But just take a wild guess at the percentage that we actually have not explored yet. Right. Almost got everyone. A couple minutes, get your vote in. I'm going to end the poll here in a second. Okay, there you go. Wow, yes, that's great. Yeah, I see no one chose 5%. <laughs> that's great. That's great. Yeah, 20%, 50%, and the majority chose 80%. Awesome. Yeah, you, you got it. Yeah, it's actually 80%. So there's uh, so much that we don't know about um, the oceans, how they work, who lives there, what lives there. Uh, so it's completely unmapped, un unobserved, and unexplored. Despite this though, it's undeniable that we already have a big and direct impact on our rivers, our lakes, and our oceans, such that our everyday actions directly affects them. So this is what we're going to talk about next. Um, feel free to use the chat uh, to write some of your ideas down. Can you guess maybe some of the impacts that we have on our rivers and our lakes and our oceans? What do you feel are the biggest impacts that we have? Seeing some things come in the chat already. Pollution and contamination were the first ones people noted. Mm -hmm. Sedimentation as well, and waste. Yeah, pollution, waste. Mm -hmm. uh, temperature rise, mm -hmm. uh, diversion, plastics, runoff from farms. Um, they're coming fast now. Threats to marine wildlife, global warming, abuse of overfishing. Um, you know, exploitation of water for, you know, for revenue from companies, industrial use, acidification, nanoplastics, I see you've got there too. And sound pollution, Otis says. Excellent. Yeah, you, you got, wow, you got so many of them already. <laughs> That's great. Thank you for sharing these. Uh, absolutely, you're right. There's a lot, a lot of threats that um, are impacting our oceans. And let's look at some of them in more detail. So first of all, already someone mentioned that overfishing. So overharvesting happens when we are fishing or hunting too much. And that has driven many animals into extinction or into very, very low uh, abundances. Um, extinction is a word that means when an animal is simply gone forever, there are none of them left. Well, some animals used to be quite abundant, uh, for example, the North Atlantic cod, the sea otter, the blue whale, but they declined due to overharvesting because we simply fished them too, too much. Uh, it's estimated that 80% of fish stocks are fully exploited. 
And also fishing nets that are used for fishing, well, they can be a major threat to species. And I think this was also mentioned by someone in the chat. Uh, so we just talked about the North Atlantic right well, and it's estimated that 80% of them have been entang entangled at least once in their lifetime. I heard a lot of you mentioning marine pollution. So definitely that is a major threat. Um, and we're talking about a really nasty mix of human waste and detergents, pesticides that we use also in our uh, farming industry, fertilizers, um, oil, toxic chemicals, plastic, of course, and all types of waste from different industries. And it's really a whole bunch of stuff that shouldn't be in our water. 80% of marine pollution comes from land. It actually works its way out to sea through our sewer pipes and our drainage basins and different wind currents that ultimately lead to rivers and streams and finally the ocean. This image, you may uh, remember it from the movie Finding Nemo. This is when Jill here is telling Nemo as they're looking out the, the window, that all drains lead to the ocean. And Jill is absolutely right. Everything that drains out of our homes will ultimately be in the ocean. So part of this problem is garbage and plastic bags. And they're especially dangerous to shorebirds, whales, and sea turtles, as well as a lot of other ocean species, because they entangle themselves in it or they choke on it. So here we have a, a turtle that thinks that the plastic bag is actually food and that would ingest it. And it's estimated that every year, 100 million marine animals die uh, from plastic waste of alone. So this is a major issue because also plastic, as I'm sure you already know, well, it pretty much stays there forever. When you go to the beach and see plastic bags or straws or water bottles, they may already have been there for a very long time. And they may also have come from another continent, another country. For example, a plastic bottle would stay for 450 years in the environment. Same for a disposable diaper. Cardboard boxes may be stays for a few months. Uh, an aluminum can can stay for 200 years. So you can see that although um, the quantity of it is a problem of the garbage and of the plastic, but also the, the time that it stays there is also a main issue. I also want to mention some other impacts. So if we look at the global ship and boat traffic, even though there are no roads on the ocean, there's definitely a lot of traffic. And it's used by all kinds of ships and sailboats and other vessels every single day they're out or they are out in the oceans in our seas in our rivers and most of them pollute and this traffic can also be a major danger for wildlife so this was also mentioned in the chat by someone thank you so much uh, one example i mentioned earlier is also ship collision with the north atlantic right whale which is one of the threats that uh, persist today we are also very good at transforming coastlines. So humans, we like to live close to the water, which is normal because we need it to survive. Uh, so we transform coastlines to build our communities and our homes and our schools, our industries, our farms, basically everything that we need to live. And sadly, the coastal environments, which again is land close to the water, well, they're hit the hardest things like estuaries and beaches and river deltas. And this unfortunately means that we're destroying wildlife habitats because coastal environments support a lot of living beings. So in this image here, it's uh, an example of this. What you can see is uh, the beach, how it was before. And then over time, you can see that there's a road, there's all types of buildings and houses and restaurants and here on the beach, uh, we also have uh, amenities for, for beachgoers. And global warming. So global warming is also one that was mentioned in the chats. And it's true, according to weather reports kept since the 1960s, the earth is definitely warming up. This is due to people because we burn too much fossil fuels like oil and coal to power everything from TVs to cars. 
And even a few degrees can mean a big change for our planet. For one thing, the oceans will get warmer. The temperature of the oceans will increase. And because water, it expands when it warms, water will slowly cover land along the coasts. Now let's imagine this is a small island. You can see that if water expands, if water expands too much, well, water will slowly just cover the island. Uh, this is also a problem for those that uh, are located close to the, to the seashore. For wildlife, it means major changes to the environment as well. As water temperature changes, water availability also change, and wildlife simply has to adapt to that reality. Whether they adapt quick enough is um, the question. So now that you're an expert on our impacts on water and the ocean, I'm sure that you also have all kinds of ideas on how we can achieve, we can address them. The key message here is that by protecting the ocean's health, we also protect the planet. And of course, a healthy planet is good news for all living things and for us as well, for humans. So if we act together to help oceans, we're helping ourselves, we're helping our friends, we're also helping our families and our communities. So feel free again to use the chat here. Um, do you have any ideas on how we can address our threats? Some of the actions that we can do to be better ocean superheroes? So Susanna said, plant more native trees. Great idea. Yeah. And Alan says, uh, inform people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, inform. So talking to your friends about it, talking to your community about it, to your family. Darlene was suggested collecting and using rainwater. Uh, Donna said, banning single-use plastics. Um, and uh, Lisa added, you know, refusing to use the single-use plastics, uh, sourcing fish from reliable sources and sustainable sources, volunteering to clean up plastics, reduce uh, our product production, uh, think about global impacts of our daily decisions. Great. Yeah, those are great ideas. Absolutely. Yeah, you have a lot of ideas on how we can address them. And one that kept popping up is indeed minimizing our waste or more specifically our plastic waste simply because plastic again just stays out there forever. So first we can look into our own homes to reduce the amount of waste that uh, you and your family produce. We can recycle, we can talk to our friends, our parents, um, if you have any suggestions uh, for your home. We can take our own tote bags to the grocery stores uh, for example, here you can see a tote bag. So instead of using uh, the plastic that the stores give you, well, you're simply reusing always the same bag. We can do the same for water bottles. We have a reusable water bottle here. We have reusable straws. Uh, for soaps, for example, we can choose a soap bar instead of those sold in a plastic container. We can reuse a lot of things and jars and bowls and uh, things that in general may be we would use once and then throw out, well, we can kind of rethink that and try to be waste-free or plastic-free as much as possible. So I do have a poll now, Kaylee again. <laughs> yeah, if you could launch it. So it's about sure. um, the items that we use, you know, our daily items and whether uh, we are reusing them already or not. So the question is, do you reuse daily items such as grocery bags, straws, and plastic cutlery and water bottles? And you can choose many of these uh, answers. So the first one is that you already reuse many things, um, that you're planning to reuse more items going forward. Also that you're planning to inform, right? To talk to your family and to see what uh, we can do more. Oh, great. Yeah, I can see the answers. Great. So many of you, the vast majority of you already reuse many things. 
and plan to reuse more items going forward. I see that some of you will also talk to your families to see what can be done more. That's great, that's wonderful. Thank you, thank you, Katie. Um, great, so we saw that litter and garbage ultimately flows to our oceans and that it can of course mean big trouble. So we have to remember to be careful with our garbage and to never litter. Also, when you're outside, you can also pick up garbage if you see it and dispose of it properly. You can join a community cleanup. So these are fun activities where you also have the opportunity to meet other people that are interested in protecting our environments. One that was mentioned in the chat also is uh, thinking about the products that we're buying. So reducing maybe some of the things that we would like to buy and if we need to buy things, looking at the materials that they're made of and deciding if an alternative might be a better choice. And uh, one thing that is interesting to look at is, for example, sustainable food options. So when we're buying seafood, when we're buying fish, seeing where this fish is sourced from. And of course, enjoying being close to water environments, canoeing and paddling and swimming, they're great activities for us. Uh, having fun and appreciating the many gifts that we receive from water is definitely a part of the many actions that we can take as well. So to celebrate Rivers to Oceans Week, that is happening this week. It starts today and it lasts until next Monday. We've prepared a bingo sheet for you with ideas of fun activities to do with your families to be ocean superheroes. So you will receive this by email, but I wanted to show today, uh, to show it to you to see so that you can see what it looks like. You can see that there's also a space for uh, your own water related action. So there's really ideas like inspecting your home for water leaks, um, doing water themed arts and crafts, becoming a citizen science, taking steps to reduce plastic use in my home. So these are all ideas that uh, you can do uh, this week or even you know, throughout the summer to celebrate Rivers to Oceans Week. And many of us will be taking part, so be sure to tick as many items as possible. You can also snap a picture of it and share this achievement with the CWF team on social media. So the hashtag that's also associated to this week-long celebration is Rivers to Oceans Week. So hashtag Rivers to Oceans Week. So finally, I want to give the floor to Kaylee, who will introduce in more detail what CWF is and also its various programs. Perfect, thanks so much, Cecile. Uh, it's so wonderful just spending time with you all talking about how important oceans are. And oceans are certainly important to us at the Canadian Wildlife Federation. I'm sure most of you are familiar with us and what we do, but I just wanted to quickly highlight our mission it, which really is to conserve, inspire the conservation of Canada's wildlife and habitats for the use and enjoyment of all. So there's three pillars to the, our mission. The first one is connecting Canadians to nature. So through our education programs, we really design to um, create experiential learning opportunities and, and curriculum-based learning for, for schools that help encourage Canadians of all age to, ages to experience and enjoy nature and to learn more about it because we think education is such a key element of conservation. But we also do work to maintain healthy wildlife populations and conserve wildlife habitat. We do a lot of research on, on specific wildlife species like the North Atlantic right whale, freshwater turtles, bats, uh, et cetera. But we also look at their habitat because it's so important to conserve that as well. So we look at freshwater and marine ecosystems, prairies and grasslands and forests. So really looking at animals, the places they live and how we fit into that picture as well. So that's a quick overview of our mission for those of you who don't know as much about us. And I'll also say uh, a few quick words about some of our other education programs because we do have a lot of programs that um, to engage different age groups. So our Wild Family Nature Club is designed to connect families with young kids to opportunities to get outside and learn more about nature. Um, both through you know, these structured activities and outdoor play, because when we establish that connection at a young age, we're more likely to, to support conservation in the future. We have a school gardening program called Wild Spaces, where you can learn more about pollinators and support pollinator conservation. 
our wild webinar program where we, we try to provide some educational opportunities online with guest speakers. Uh, our wild outside program, which is uh, a, a program that engages 15 to 18 year olds in getting out in nature um, through hands on activities, as well as community service. And uh, our wild education program, which is for educators providing professional development and educational resources to bring learning into classrooms. But I wanted to end with our Canadian Conservation Corps program, which is targeted at 18 to 30 year olds. And it's very much a leadership program um, for conservation. And Cecile is part of that program. So Cecile, I'll throw it back to you and maybe you can tell us a bit about your experience as a CCC participant. Absolutely, thank you, Katie. So yeah, I, as Katie mentioned, I'm part of the CCC program. So this is a three-part program that includes a wilderness journey in partnership with At We're Bound. There's also a field placement with a conservation organization in Canada. And finally, there's a self-directed service project um, that uh, you can do, uh, yeah. And in total, it lasts for nine months. I highly recommend it. It's for youth aged 18 to 30 years old. And uh, for me, the CCC was a great opportunity to learn more about the Canadian environment. Uh, I had the opportunity to go canoe and camping uh, in Ontario, and I met other people who were very interested in uh, protecting and conserving our, our environment. And this talk that we're doing today is part of my uh, self-directed service project, also the CCC. So. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for participating and for joining today. I hope that you found it interesting and that you're also excited for the activities on the bingo sheet that you'll receive by email. And we just wanted to wish you all a great Rivers to Oceans week. Yeah, and we'll follow up with some additional resources for you at the bingo card and some additional links. I see there was a couple questions in the chat that we didn't get a chance mm -hmm. to get to but we'll have resources for you to continue your learning journey and hopefully connect with more uh, activities and resources, both at home, at school, and in your communities. Great, so thanks so much, Cecile, and thanks to everyone who joined us today. Just really thrilled uh, to have you all and hope you have a fantastic Rivers to Oceans week this week. <laughs> Thank you, you too, Kaylee. Thank you so much for helping. All right, well, bye everyone, take care. Take care. Bye.